Would you actually mind repeating that intro? Unfortunately, uh, it uh, glitched just for a oh, moment. And we missed thank it. You. Yeah. No, so I just want to acknowledge that we are doing this meeting via Zoom. And so for the future and for anyone who wants to access it, you can view it in the YouTube link that's provided on the webpage for the town of Scarborough. Or if you want to attend it, you have to go to the town of the Zoning Board of Appeals webpage. Is that right, Brian? You can actually go to the home page of the town website and down in the right hand corner, there's the town calendar. And you can click virtual planning uh, zoning board meeting and you have both choices are right there. Okay, perfect. I just want to make sure everyone has the right access that they need if they do want to speak. Um, if you are an attendee tonight, you are muted and must raise your hand. I guess there's a little hand feature that you can raise during the public comments part. Uh, the public comments part actually comes in about the middle of the appeal. So not at the beginning, but halfway through the appeal, you'll see that there's a time for you to speak. Um, if any time you guys lose me, our vice chair, Mr. Hebert, will take over. Um, so at this time, what I would like to do is rise and do the Pledge of Allegiance. We have our flag today. I should have got my little flag. Can we just do it? Hang on, I'm working on it. I'm almost okay. there. <laughs> Fine. That's all right. Let's see. Why isn't it uh, clicking over? Sorry. Right here, for some reason, it's not clicking over. Important part of the process. And. I guess I have to apologize. I'm not sure what's going on with that. It's okay. We can do it. That's all right. We're just gonna we're gonna go ahead and I'll do the There it is. There it is. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So first, I will do the roll call. We have Mr. Bork. Oh, he's here. I think he's still on mute, but he's here. Mr. Karen. Yes, here. Mr. Hebert. Here. And Mr. Hal. Here. And I am Karen Shoot, your chair. So welcome, everybody. This meeting will now come to order. This is a public proceeding and unless the board specifically votes to go into an executive session, the public has the right to hear everything that is being said and to view all the exhibits that are being presented this evening. Please notify me if you are unable to hear or see the proceedings. The board works from a prepared agenda and we'll take up tonight's items in the following order. First, we have the approval of minutes and the approval of the draft written decisions from May 13th, 2020. And then we have three appeals this evening. The first appeal is appeal number 2687, which is a limited reduction of yard size for 27 King Street. And then we have appeal number 2688, which is an administrative appeal regarding one Pillsbury Drive. And our last appeal is appeal number 2689, which is a limited reduction of yard size for 82 Sawyer Road. In each instance, the burden is upon the applicant to demonstrate the compliance with each of the criteria or provisions of the applicable appeal. The board will ask questions as necessary to understand the nature of the appeal as fully as possible. When all testimony has been heard, the chairman will close the record and the board will adopt its findings of fact for each criteria of the appeal and vote to determine if the applicant has met the burden of proof necessary for that criteria. It is important to note that if any of the appeal or special exception criteria have not been met, the board must deny the appeal or application. In many cases, the applicant or the landowner may have a personal problem, which prompted the request for the variance. Please understand that this is not legally relevant to the appeal, no matter how sympathetic the board may be to your situation. After the board votes on the merits of each criteria, a motion may be made to approve the appeal. And if 
there is a second, a discussion will follow. The board will state its conclusions of law based on the findings of fact to support a decision on that motion. A general vote will then be taken on the appeal if the majority of the voting members present vote in the affirmative, the appeal is approved. And if a majority of the voting members vote in the negative, the appeal is denied. The board's decision stands as of the date of the vote was taken, regardless of the approval of the final written decision. Generally speaking, appeals from adverse decisions must be filed with the Superior Court, except You're frozen again, Karen. Questions through me. Hey, Karen. Yeah. Madam Chair, actually, could you repeat that starting at the Superior Court um, yeah. line, please? Thank you. I just got that notice that I was clipping out a little bit. Yeah, that's fine. So As it happens, I'll catch you. Thing here, and so, um, so generally speaking, appeals from the adverse decisions must be filed with the Superior Court. So, if you want to appeal your decision this evening, you have 45 days from today. And again, just a reminder to everyone that this is a public proceeding and you have the right to hear and see everything that is happening this evening. All persons speaking will be asked to first state their name and address or affiliation and all board members and interested parties are asked to direct their questions through me. So, thank you. And with that being said, the board's first going to approve the minutes from the meeting of May 13th, 2020. Um, I guess at this point, I'll, if anyone had any questions or concerns or issues with the minutes, I think I just ask you to raise your hand and, and address them. Otherwise, I would look for a motion to approve. Madam Chair? Yes. Um, point of order, would you want to designate Mr. Howe as a voting member tonight, please? Yeah, thank you. So we are missing a board member. And so Mr. Howe is now going to be a voting full member this evening. Thank you, Mr. Howe. Thank you. Okay, and that's good. So we have five people this evening. And with that being said, we would like to try to stick to the same order that we did the other evening. So with that, Mr. Bork, do you want to I make a motion? I make a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting on May 13th, 2020. Do I have a second? Who's my second? Who always did the second? Second. We're going in alphabetical order, are we not? Here we are. Okay, so Mr. Karen. All right, I second. All in favor? I think yep, that's fine. So that's five to approve. Just okay. a reminder, uh, Karen, that uh, votes are supposed to be done by roll call. Um, okay. I, sorry, I know it feels a little silly sometimes of over minutes, but. <laughs> I'm just speeding up maybe a little bit. Okay, so we will go through. So Mr. Bork, how do you vote on the minute? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Mr. Heber? Yes. And Mr. Howe? I, I saw you say yes, I didn't hear you. Yes. Yeah, okay, and I say yes. So that's <laughs> And then we have the written decision for appeal number 2683 for a limited reduction of yard size at 165 Spurwink Road. Um, I would ask if the board had any questions or concerns or any corrections that you please raise your hand and address those now. Otherwise, I would look for a motion. Motion to approve appeal number 2683 as written. Motion to second. How do you vote, Mr. Bork? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Mr. Hebert? Yes. Mr. Howe? Yes. And I vote yes as well, so that is approved. We have the written decision for appeal number 2684, a limited reduction of yard size for 57 Old Blue Point Road. I know everyone has had a chance to review all the materials this evening. Did anyone have any concerns? motion. Uh, Madam Chair, motion to appeal, uh, approve appeal number 2684 as written. 
Motion to second. How do you vote, Mr. Bork? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Mr. Hebert? Yes. Mr. Howe? Yes. And I vote yes as well. That is approved. We have the written decision for appeal number 2685, limited reduction of yard size for 15 Shipwreck Road. If no one has any questions or concerns or changes, I'll ask for a motion. Motion to approve appeal number 2685 as written. Motion to second. Mr. Bork, how you vote? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Mr. Hebert? Yes. Mr. Howe? Yes. And I vote yes as well. That is approved. Okay, last one. Appeal number 2686 for a practical difficulty variance for H Avenue 2. Again. Anyone have any questions or concerns about that one? No. Okay, we have a motion. Madam Chair, motion to appeal uh, to approve appeal number 2686 as written. Motion to second. And how do you vote, Mr. Bork? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Mr. Hebert? I vote yes. And Mr. Howe? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Okay. Thank you for bearing with us, folks. We will move on now. on staff from the town to give us a little background. Hey, Karen. Yeah. Oh, I it's okay. Yeah. No, it's okay. Would you mind just re uh, redoing that intro for, I believe, 2687 again? Yeah, I apologize, everyone. I'm having a little bit of internet connection issues this evening. So the first appeal this evening is for a limited reduction of yard size for 27 King Street. And it looks like Michael Downing is is he going to be presenting on behalf of Tammy Lesser, or are you guys together? Yeah, both we're, of us. We're both here. Hi. We have a slideshow, but I think that might have been a little overdone. <laughs> so what I'm going to do first is have Mr. Longstaff from the town give us a little bit of background, and then you guys can jump on, okay? Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, this is a limited reduction of yard size variance application uh, or appeal. Uh, for a single family dwelling, it was built in 1870, so it certainly meets the uh, criteria for the age of the home um, uh, for this type of appeal. It is also not in uh, uh, the shoreland zone or the uh, floodplain. Um, it is in the back dune, D2 area. Um, the appellant requests this variance to place a 10 by 12 foot shed um, at 10 feet from the west property line, 14 feet from the south property line, and 24 feet from Avenue 1 front yard um, property line. Um, so this would be a variance of 5 feet, 1 feet, and 6 feet, respectively. Good evening, Ms. Lesser. Thank you for joining us. Did you guys want to add a little bit? Should we share? I mean, we did put together a little um, slideshow just to go through each question with each answer. I don't know if that's too much or we could just talk to it. Um, so typically what we do is as you saw Brian and we'll introduce it. I don't know if you want to add anything. It's a pretty straightforward thing. You're looking to do a shed. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. You know, if you don't want to elaborate, what we can do is simply die the application. And, um, and oh boy. Um, and then you can just in your answers. I think someone's sharing their screen right now. I know, it threw me off. That's <laughs> um, yeah, basically it's it's a storage shed, just as Brian had, had mentioned. Um, without the uh, variance, it obviously would be in a spot that, that wouldn't um, fit. And we have gotten approval from all of our, our neighbors Okay. Yep. I don't think a lot of folks down there have a lot of room to work with. No, and we kind of have a double whammy because we're on a corner lot. Um, so we have the front setback, the side setback. Um, 
So we're, we're a little bit disadvantaged there. All right, so what we'll do is while Mr. Longstaff is kind of pulling this stuff up, he's having the exhibits on so everyone can see them. I will start reading the questions. If you guys just want to simply read your answers in, you're free to elaborate if you want to, okay? Okay, great. All right, so number one, the existing building or structure on the lot for which the limited reduction of yard size residential is requested was erected prior to July 3rd, 1991, or the lot is a vacant non-conforming lot. Correct. And I think you said in the beginning that the house was built in the 1800s. Yeah, 1870. 1870 yeah. Yeah. You can't really confuse that with 1991. <laughs> that was a reno that was done um, back That's in 1991. Okay, so oh, oh, okay. Uh, two, the requested reduction is reasonably mm. necessary to permit the owner or occupant of the property to use and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties are utilized in the zoning district. So, you know, usually our neighbors, all of them have either a garage, an attached garage, a two car garage, a shed, um, or all of the above, um, helping with their, their storage needs. So for us, granting relief will allow us to have um, just storage for our belongings. It's it's our lawnmower, our snowblower, um, all kinds of uh, wheelbarrow, things of that nature, which is uh, crowding up the um, backyard right now. Right. Understandable. Kind of an eyesore. Very much an eyesore. It's a very main problem. <laughs> <laughs> we all have so much stuff to take care of all the seasons. True. Right. Sure. Number three, do the physical features of the lot and or location of the existing structures on the lot, it would not be practical to construct the proposed expansion, enlargement, or new structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard size requirement. No, without relief, we cannot purchase or install um, the storage shed given the, the setback requirements. We have two front yards and it leaves merely five feet. And Brian did point us in this direction uh, with a limited reduction, and it seemed like a, a, a good solution. So, uh, given the fact that all we had was five feet to work with in the beginning, it really um, it necess necessitated this process. Right. Yeah, you're not the most the only unfortunate person who's come before us on that situation, being on a corner lot. Yeah. Yeah. We have a better updated picture, but. <laughs> That's actually the old place. Yeah, that, that looks a little bit more beaten down, but. Which conforms to the yard size requirements. Uh-oh. Did you guys hear me all that? Uh, just a little bit. Four. Question four, I knew Go it was that. Yeah. Question number four, should I reread it? No, we're good. Okay, if you wanna read your answer. Sure, so after installation of the storage shed, the impact on the neighborhood obviously will be positive and certainly not su substantially different. Um, one may expect to see storage sheds on uh, people's properties. So without relief, again, we could not in uh, install the, the shed and the proposed location of the shed would be between two trees um, within the backyard right now. And, and we would also make it um, decorated for the holidays, things of that nature. Yeah, yeah totally. Okay. And number five, the applicant has not commenced construction on the enlargement expansion building or structure for which a limited reduction in yard size is requested. That's correct, that's true. That is right, we have not. I feel like it's hard to do anything down there without people knowing right away. <laughs> <laughs> you think? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so that's great. I mean, it's a pretty straightforward application. We see these all the time. I don't know if the board has any specific questions for the applicants at this time. Um, I can't see everybody right now. So I'm just telling the board that so if you're raising your hand, I can't see you. See you. I have a question, Madam Chair. Okay. Now I can, yes. Um, so my question um, for the uh, applicants, so you've gone through um, the property outline with Brian and uh, of all the locations that you can logically place the shit on the property, you've come to determine that this is the most ideal location and logical spot? 
That's correct. And you've you've investigated other options, putting it on the property near to the house, or the opposite corner, uh, near the driveway, and so on. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Hebert, there's uh, there's virtually no room on this lot, and uh, it needs to go in the backyard, and there's just no there's no room in there. You know, it's a tiny lot. Understood. Right. Yeah, and it sounds like you're sticking it in between some trees already. Yes. <laughs> Or else, yeah, the walkway. There was a couple other options. <laughs> and and I'll I'll just add real briefly, and this is for anyone else listening as well. It's even though it's right here in front of us, the the document clearly indicates you've chosen the correct spot. It's nice for us to to hear it um, voiced on the record so that it's recorded and people can see that. Oh, certainly, okay. Gotcha. So if the Madam question Chair. seems straightforward, then there's a reason why. Okay. Did you have a question, Mr. Howe? Uh, yes, the shed itself, is it going to be on a foundation, a permanent foundation, or is this just going to be sitting on uh, uh, sleepers, if you will, or sitting on the ground? Mr. Howe, it is, uh, a, uh, it's not on a foundation. It won't be a permanent structure. And our hope is that uh, when it's windy down here, it doesn't pick it up and move it for us. Right. So, so it is something that could be movable in the future. I believe so. I, yeah, I, I guess if you were inclined, you could move it as long as you had a lot of, you know, young men to do that for us. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Do we have any other questions from any board members? No? Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna close this part of the hearing and I'm gonna open it up to the public. Um, it does look like we have some letters on file that I will address. I don't know if there's anyone attending the meeting this evening that wanted to speak. I think you would have to hit the little hand raise thing in the chat, right? Someone? That is correct. Yep, there's a little hand raise feature at the bottom. Um, at this point, I'm not seeing anyone raising their hands. That doesn't surprise me because we have a stack of letters here in <laughs> from their neighbors. So I don't think they felt the need to come this evening. No. Um, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to read this in for the record real quick once, and then I'm going to go through and I'll explain it. So it looks like Tammy Lesser and Michael Downing sent a letter to their neighbors. And the letter was to our neighbors. Tammy and I want to install a 10 by 12 storage shed on our property at 27 King Street. The setback required with the small lot of 50 by 101 means we cannot obtain a permit from the town for a storage shed. We seek relief by applying for a variant to be presented to the town zoning board of appeals. Integral to our success in, in this matter is to present the town with all abutters with their name, streets, and mailing address. We ask for your support with our efforts, with your signature, that you will help us obtain the variance of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Thank you for your consideration, Tammy Lesser and Michael Downing. So what I'm going to do now is I have a stack of letters here, and I'm going to acknowledge all of the neighbors and their address who signed these in support of this appeal this evening. So first we have Richard Milliken from 32 King Street. He signed in support. And then one of their abutters is the Sister of Mercy of the American Northeast who signed this in support. We have the oh, she's frozen again. I'll mention it to her. Lionel and Sally Jean of 11 Ocean, I mean, 11 Avenue 1 Extension. Madam Chair. A letter in support. Yeah. Madam Chair, um, I apologize, but you cut out right before you started reading the first name. I think it was uh, either Richard we had Millican. You up to the where did you lose me? I'm so sorry, everybody. We got the Sisters of Mercy. The next one okay. is where we lost. Yes. Right. So we have a letter of support from 26 King Street. I'm trying to read their signature. It looks like Dudley and Jolene Karen. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then we have Lee Hodgkins at 19 King Street. We signed the letter in support. And that's it. 
It should be one from the Hoys at 28, I believe. Hmm. So yeah, we have uh, Lionel and Sally Jean. Right. Yeah, they're at uh, 11 Avenue One. And uh, and then the uh, Dorothy and Frank Hoy. Yes. Okay. At 28 King Street. Right. Okay, here we go. So that was a lot of support. That is good. That being said, it doesn't appear that anyone is here this evening to speak in support or against. So I'm going to close the public part of the hearing. And now the board is going to do their findings of facts and conclusions of law. Okay. So we're going to go through the questions. The existing building or structure on the lot for which the limited reduction of yard size residential is required was erected prior to July 3rd, 1991. Um, pretty straightforward. I think the town records would reflect that the house is built in 1870 or is at least older than 1991. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to elaborate on that. All in favor of one being met. Uh, roll call, Madam Chair. So I think what we did last time is we do the straw poll for each criteria, and then we'll do the roll call, the final vote. Makes sense. Okay. Okay. So that's so now we're going to just raise our hand, and each board member is going to say if they're in support or not. So all in favor of one being that. Okay. So that's five. Number two, the requested reduction is reasonably necessary to permit the owners or occupants of the property to use and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties are utilized in the zoning district. So now I'll ask you, Mr. Bork, if you want to comment. Okay, uh, you want comment? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I certainly agree that the criteria here has been met. The neighbors support it. And it's very fitting to the neighborhood. Okay. Mr. Karen? I agree. Unfortunately, I do not have anything to add. Okay. Mr. Heber? Um, I agree. I mean, they have, as stated, uh, neighbors and uh, other neighbors in this neighborhood have either a shed or they have a garage or they have both. And due to the, um, and this is also tying into no, point number three, but unique circumstances of the lot because it's a corner lot, um, they don't have, they are not able to enjoy the backyard or have that level of storage that other homes are in that neighborhood. Mr. Howe? No, I spent a fair amount of time down there and, and I'm sure they'd like to put their belongings into something and close the door. Um, <laughs> as far as, uh, like we all do sometimes. Um, as far as the, this maybe is just a question for Brian, if I can. Is this a reduction in yard size if this structure is not permanent? That's a question for Brian. I we don't distinguish between permanent or or uh, temporary because it's a structure that is affixed to the ground in some way on or in or below and and therefore we don't distinguish between that um there really isn't anything like a temporary structure anyway it's either it either is or it is not um and this is this is a structure sheds are, are things that we permit and they must meet setbacks okay Thank you. Um, I think I agree with the board here. I think if you kind of go anywhere in Maine, especially down in Pine Point, this area, everyone's got some sort of storage with a garage or a shed. Um, all in favor of two being that. Okay, that's five. Three, due to the physical features of the lot and or location of the existing structure on the lot, it would not be practical to construct the proposed expansion, enlargement, or new structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard size requirement. Mr. Bork? Uh, this is really the best possible location for the shed. And I particularly like the fact that it's right in between two trees. 
and the, the way it's placed is going to be very, very attractive. Uh, so it's, it's the best possible way. And I like the fact that Brian was consulted in coming up with this uh, placement. So I agree this uh, has been it. Okay, I have to be honest and I, my whole computer, I missed that whole comment. I apologize. I'm not sure I could repeat it for verbatim. <laughs> Basically, I said, yes, this is the best, best place to put the shed. And uh, I think it was uh, commendable that uh, uh, the, the appellates, uh, uh, you know, discussed it with Brian ahead of time to uh, come up with a placement that would be best for the lot. This is really the only feasible place to put it. All right, Mr. Karen. I agree, as discussed, due to the existing setbacks and the two front yards, this is the most ideal spot on the property. The fact that there are trees there to help disguise it uh, from the street is added benefit. And as Mr. Heber already asked, um, it has been uh, evaluated elsewhere on the property and determined that this is the most ideal spot. Mr. Heber. Uh, my thoughts align with those of Mr. Karen uh, in that the applicant has consulted with the town and has looked at other homes in the area as well as consulted their neighbors for an appropriate location. And it appears to be that this is the one due to the fact that they have two uh, street frontages. Yeah. Mr. Howe? Here are the comments that have been made, nothing to add. Yep, I think as I stated earlier, we do come across these every once in a while. And I think, you know, having the two street funded is definitely a big hurdle to overcome. And we appreciate Brian long staff working with all the applicants to try to at least get you to this point. So all in favor of three being met. Okay, that's five. Number four, the impacts and effects of the enlargement, expansion, or new building or structure on the existing uses in the neighborhood will not be substantially different from or greater than the impacts and effects of a building or structure which conforms to the yard size requirement. Mr. Uh, my, my comment uh, here is that uh, it's entirely um, blending in with the neighborhood. Uh, it's consistent with the other structures, uh, other homes which have sheds. Uh, it fits in very nicely to the neighborhood. No impact, no negative impact at all in the neighborhood. Mr. Karen. I agree. The size of the shed as compared to other properties adjacent nearby with the size of garages, multi-car garages, this would conform and not be overly impactful. Good point. Mr. Hebert. I agree in that this isn't going to be overly impactful. Uh, it's going to be very similar to other homes in the area who, like I said previously, have a shed or a garage. Uh, it's also worthy of note that um, this particular shed is the smallest uh, in its class of the information that they have provided us. So they're not seeking for a Taj Mahal of sheds here in their backyard. Mr. Howe. Nothing to add. Yeah, the board did a great job kind of summarizing this one. Uh, all in favor of four being met. And that's five. And number five, the applicant has not commenced construction on the enlargement expansion building or structure for which the limited reduction in yard size is requested. The applicant testified this evening and as we joked, I don't think they would begin anything down there without anyone knowing. Um, so all in favor of five being met. Okay. Do I have a motion? Madam Chair, yes. Uh, I have a motion to um, approve appeal number 2687. I move the second. Okay. Any discussion? No. Nope. Uh, how do you vote, Mr. Bork? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Mr. Hebert? I vote yes. Mr. Howe? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So your appeal is approved. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Thanks, Brian. Church that will be in for a permit, Brian. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. 
we'll give us a minute here to get the next applicant lined up. I see, is it Marcel Nato? Yes. Okay, do you have video or are you gonna be doing just do. audio? This I do, but I don't know how to get to it, I guess. Start, start video maybe? Yep. Oh, okay, there we go. There we go. There we go, perfect. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so are you ready, Mr. Longstaff? Yes, I am. Okay, so we're going to go into the next appeal here, which is an administrative appeal regarding the property at One Pillsbury Drive. And we have tonight with us the owner, Marcel Nato. Um, an administrative appeal. I think I've been on the board maybe six years. We've maybe had one other one. It's actually pretty sort of straightforward. Um, the applicant this evening is appealing the decision. Karen, we're not hearing you. We'll wait till she gets back first. Give us the history which brought us here today. Am I Excuse me, Madam Chair. Yeah. Would you mind repeating that section you just did last 30 seconds or so? Sure. Um, so this is an administrative appeal. Sorry if I'm repeating myself again. Um, which we don't have. So Mr. Marcel is specifically um, appealing the decision that Brian and the code enforcement office made um, in regards to his fence. So what we need you to decide tonight is if we agree with the decision that Mr. Longstaff from the town of Scarborough made and if their mistake was, ma was made. So with that, I'm gonna ask Mr. Longstaff to give us a little bit of background and how we got here this evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you only freeze up when you talk, so. Okay. I don't know if that helps you at all. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, administrative appeal, uh, basically um, Mr. Nadeau is um, uh, asking the board to determine whether or not um, there was an error made in the determination by uh, the building inspector or the zoning, uh, zoning administrator or in our case, both. Um, the background on this is that uh, the appellant owns the single family dwelling at one Pillsbury Drive. Um, the parcel is zoned R2. It's partially in the Shoreland Overlay Zone and the back dune. Um, at some date prior to April 24, 2020, the appellant removed or caused the removal of some vegetated buffer that was next to the west property line of his parcel and he erected a a wooden picket style fence as a buffer between his property and the herd park facilities. Um, on April 24, 2020, in response to three separate complaints that I received, and after some subsequent investigation during which um, I measured the fence from the um, uh, park side uh, and determined that um, the majority of the fence is over seven feet tall, uh, close to eight feet tall and uh, I issued a notice of uh, violation in order for corrective action. Um, the order, uh, the notice stated that the fence, any fence greater than seven feet in height does require a permit and therefore must be treated as a structure. And that must then also adhere to the structural setbacks to property lines, or as we call them, yard, uh, front side and rear yard uh, uh, setbacks. So uh, this fence obviously does not, it's, very close to the property line, if not on it. And, um, and additionally, I did check with the Maine Department of Environmental Protection and it does require a permit by rule as well. And they do have vegetation standards, which I believe Mr. Nadeau has made contact with Maine DEP and is in the process of getting that permit by rule application. I don't know if he's heard back from them yet or not, uh, but uh, there are some limits to vegetation removal, which he may or may not have exceeded. Um, and after, I think with that background, um, again, the administrative appeal is something that the board is authorized to hear and decide 
There is no set of standards. They're simply your job tonight is to listen to the testimony and the and uh, or look over the documents that Mr. Nadeau has uh, provided. Um, listen to my my explanation of how I came to the determination, and then you guys make up your mind, uh, you know, as to how you interpret the ordinance. Was I correct? Was I incorrect? Um, and uh, I believe the uh, ordinance actually allows you to. Um, you can modify or reverse uh, the determination of, of the uh, building inspector. So you have some leeway to decide how you want to handle this. I think with that, um, we should let Mr. Nadeau pre present his case, and then I would like to have the opportunity to present um, my reason. Thank you. I'm Good on. evening, Mr. Nadeau. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, would you like to dive right in and tell us what's sure. going on? Sure. So I just can't find anything in the ordinance that says that a fence over seven feet is subject to uh, meeting a setback. It's, it's defined that a fence is, it, in your definitions of structure, fences are, um, how they put it, um, are, um, are not considered structures and find how it's worded. Um, and I just, and I think Bill was going by um, the 2015 IRC, International Residential Code. And he's saying that because a seven foot or less fence does not require a permit, then a fence over seven feet does require a permit. And then if it's over seven feet, it's also a structure and that then it's got to meet a setback, but there's nothing, nothing in there that says anywhere that a fence over seven feet is a structure or that a fence has to meet a setback in any of your, in any of your ordinances that I can find. The reason, the way I interpret the IRC and even your, um, oh, you have another uh, quest fact sheet in your website is that a fence over seven, over seven feet may be subject to permitting because of structural integrity. So if you look at uh, in the IRC, retaining walls, for example, over four feet are so need a permit. Uh, now in a, in a contradiction is that if in the IRC, a structure, a single story structure, 200 feet or less uh, does not need a permit. So, but I know I couldn't build a structure 200 square feet on my property line. So there's some real contradicting uh, information in, in this. And I just can't find anything that says a fence over seven feet is a structure and then it has to meet a setback. There's just nothing in your building codes that say that. Okay. So and so, I mean, be... Mr. Longstaff pretty much told you this is just sort of common law procedure with Scarborough and that's kind of operating in how it's been done. Is that correct? I'm sorry, are you asking me? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. My, my internet. No, it's okay. I, I didn't know if you were asking Brian one step. No, I, I was just asking you kind of, you were saying you don't see a definition. So your interpretation was this is just kind of how the town's always handled it. Yeah, I just don't see I don't see anything where I would need to meet a setback, or, or that the fence is a structure and that it needs to meet a setback. Okay. Because everything else in your in your ordinance says that a fence is not a structure. Right. So, and it doesn't say whether that, what height fence that is. Okay. So that's my, my case. Okay. And, honest, okay. and, and honestly, I didn't intend, I, what I did was last fall when I got the fence company out, I said, well, I want to put a fence up and they designed, I said, yeah, design what you want. I use Ron Forrest a lot. I said, tell me what you think would look best. He designed it. I didn't even give it any thought as to the height of the fence. Right. It's not like I intentionally tried to do something. So he put the fence up and then, then we have a problem. So, right. um, and now it's just, I just can't cut a foot off the top of the fence. It's just, you can't do that to the style fence. So. So that's my reason, reason for being here. Yes, um, 
So I think we'll ask, we rely heavily on Mr. Longstaff. He knows this ordinance is in and out and he's been working for the town for a long time. So now I'll, I'll ask Mr. Longstaff kind of um, to tell us maybe his interactions with you and how it went down. And then I would also appreciate maybe some general information, Mr. Longstaff, about when people come to you proposing a seven foot fence and how you counsel them and things like that. Sure. Um, if you if you want, I, I think it might be helpful too. And I apologize to Mr. Neto. I should have offered to bring up some of the, the items that you have in your packets in front of you. I'm sure you all have the applications in front of you, but for those that are viewing, maybe don't understand what we're talking about and it might help Mr. Neto uh, explain his points and it'll probably help me explain mine. I'd like to share my screen for just a moment if I could. Yeah. So here's what the, the boundary line between the park, which is on the right and Mr. Neto's house on the left. Does everybody see this by the way? I wanna make sure, yeah, yeah. okay. Yes. Um, so, so this is what the vegetation looked like before it was removed. Um, once the fence was up, this is sort of from the same location on the street looking at the fence. Um, this is down towards the beach, looking back towards the street to the left. That's from the building, the restroom area. Restroom area, correct, yep. And then this is a, a, a picture that Mr. Neto sent me with the seven foot mark in, shown in blue tape on the fence. And this is the property survey uh, that he provided in his um, application. So the fence is, of course, along this line where he's got the new fence shown here. So I don't, I don't know if that helps everybody sort of put it in context, but I think it's just helpful to see what's there. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen now. And um, so, so generally speaking, I probably got in, in, a, in any given week, I might get three or four calls from people asking where they can put a fence and how high it has to be. And so I'm, I'm very used to answering those questions. And my stock answer because of the IRC 2015, which says that a seven foot fence is exempt um, and which we all know you can have boundary line fences uh, and they don't have to meet a setback our interpretation is that if it's exempt from a permit, if it's seven feet or less, then it can be a boundary line fence. If it's going to be higher than seven feet and requires a permit, then it's like everything else that, uh, that we affix to the earth that requires a permit. For example, I don't require a permit for a clothesline pole. I don't require a permit for a trellis, but a fence, because of the, the way it's constructed, it can be quite not only is it uh, not only can it become a wind sail and has a kind of a structural aspect that needs to be dealt with but it can if it's too tall look like a wall and and a wall is very intrusive and it also flies uh, in the face of state statute state statute on uh, spite fences title 17 section subsection 2801 spite fences any fence or other structure in the nature of a fence unnecessarily exceeding six feet in height, maliciously kept and maintained for the purpose of annoying the owners or occupants of adjoining property shall be deemed a private nuisance. Now, I'm not saying that that fence necessarily meets all of the, that criteria, but that's, that's why spite fences, uh, that's probably been on the books for a hundred years in, in the state of Maine. Um, but I think that that's one of the reasons why a seven feet or less fence is exempt in the building code and therefore doesn't need to meet property line setbacks because it's not as obtrusive. If you start to go higher than that, it can be considered a spite fence because it's so high. Um, I, and again, Mr. Neto's correct. The ordinance does not talk about any of this. It does not address any of this. What it does address is the definition of structure. And he's correct in that our definition of structure says anything constructed or erected except a boundary wall or fence. A boundary wall or fence. So my interpretation of that is it's a boundary fence. It's either a boundary wall or fence. 
You could have a boundary wall, you can have a boundary fence. Um, the use of which requires a fixed location on the ground or attached to something fixed on the ground, whether installed above or below the surface of land or water. So our policy has been since I arrived in Scarborough in 2013, there were two long-term code enforcement officers who had worked under Dave Grisk, who, uh, who was the chief code enforcement officer. And they informed me that the policy was at the time, IRC said six feet or less. And in 2015, they went to seven feet. Um, they said anything over six feet was considered a structure, was considered uh, to need a, or was required to need a permit and therefore must meet property line setbacks. So when people call and ask about fences and I tell them, yeah, you can have an eight foot fence or a 10 foot fence, but it now has to meet, it has to be 15 feet off your side property line or your rear property line. Usually they're not interested anymore because nobody wants a fence that takes up that much of their yard unless it's enclosing a swimming pool or something where they want total privacy. So in the seven years that I've worked here, I, I'm pretty sure I issued one fence permit for a fence that was taller than the, the limit of, I think at the time, six feet. I cannot remember for the life of me what property it was. And I want to say it was probably a larger lot. So the, the setback didn't bother them um, as much. But most people at Pine Point or Higgins Beach or any of the small lot type districts in, in Scarborough are not going to want to place a fence 15 feet in. So therefore, they comply with the seven feet or less requirement. And they can place it anywhere they want, as long as it's not in the right of way. And so um, going back to the definition section, how do, how do I get there? Well, again, I think that the it is, it is exempt as a structure if it's seven feet or less. If it's over seven feet, I consider it a structure, even though it doesn't say that, because at that point, it can't be a boundary line or fence because it's got to meet a setback. Um, and then when you get to the setback, we don't define setback is not a term we define. We define yard. So it's front yard, side yard, rear yard. And the definition of yard is a space open to the sky, which is not occupied with any buildings or structures and is located on the same lot with a building or structure. So that's how I get to the setback piece. I, if, it's, if it is no longer exempt as a structure because it's over seven feet, again, my interpretation doesn't say that in the ordinance, then it must be a structure and therefore it must meet that yard setback, whether it's front, side, or rear. I've been following that policy and that interpretation for seven years. I can't count on both hands and feet and your hands and feet, the number of people who have been told they cannot have a seven foot or higher fence, uh, excuse me, higher than seven foot fence um, and not meet the setback. So there have been many people who have come for a higher fence and the, the interpretation, they've accepted the interpretation and they've reduced the height of the fence. If Mr. Nato had asked, that's what I would have told him. And then he would have told Mr. Forrest, and, and I can guarantee I'm gonna have a conversation with Mr. Forrest <laughs> because this is um, something that shouldn't happen. A, if the owner doesn't ask, then the fence company should. But I didn't get a, a call from either. And um, had he asked or Mr. Forrest asked about the rules, that's what I would have told him. And I guarantee the fence would have been less than seven feet high. Okay. Mr. Nato, do you have anything else you want to say before we move sure. on? Sure. I just, again, your ordinance, nothing says that in there that a fence over seven feet needs to meet a uh, setback. It just says fences are exempt from, from, meeting, from having a, are exempt from being a structure. So I just don't see anything in your ordinance that says that. That's my Madam Chair, I'd like to ask one more question if I could. Madam Chair, she's frozen. Give her a moment to come back. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I'm back. Um, 
if, if I could ask uh, something I didn't ask Mr. Nato, um, was, had he, did he look at the definitions in, in our ordinance before the fence was installed or after, after he received the notice of violation? No, I looked at it afterwards. Okay. I just wasn't, I wasn't aware of, I knew a fence could be on a, on a sideline and I kept it six inches onto my property. Okay. And, uh, and the reason for the, for the fence in the first place is I am abutting a municipality or what, I'm not sure what Heard Park is, but I mean, it's a parking lot. So it's not, I'm try not trying to be spiteful to a neighbor or anybody like that, it's a parking lot. And I'm trying to get, um, and, the, and the other thing is if there's 20 foot high trees there, what's the difference if it's trees or a, or a fence? I mean, I, I don't see the, and there were, there were huge trees there and big old pine trees that, that I were worried about falling on the house. So that's why it was removed. And trash blows in into, the, into a tree line. That's another reason for the fence. So, um, buy a house next to that location. Yeah, and I, I understand that, but that when I bought the house, I said that's that's what I was going to do. You know, that was in my head, so I understand completely. Um, does the board have any questions for Mr. Longstaff or Mr. Nato? I have Mr. Karen. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I don't know how relevant to tonight's discussion, but in reviewing some of the documentation that was provided for us. Um, I just want to bring the attention to the warranty deed, page two, item G. Mr. Karen. Interesting. To clarify what Mr. Karen is bringing to our attention is a part of the D that was submitted this evening by the applicant under G is a restriction that is placed on his property and the G restriction mm -hmm. says no fence to be erected or maintained on said lot shall be more than 42 inches in height. Oh, I didn't see that. that? <laughs> Come on, Matthew. I didn't see that. What's that? 3.5 feet? Mm. I had to do the math. I'm that bad. Um, I wonder if that's in all the deeds in the neighborhood. Because there's people here that have seven foot high fences. All right, we're going to we're going to keep going. Um, I, I don't really know how to proceed. I have another I have a question um, yeah, real quick ahead. for the applicant. Um, did you know that you're in a back dune? when um when the fence was going up um no i wouldn't think okay okay thanks um i think madam chair for this and then for the board as well to keeping perspective on this we're not uh, we're not redesigning anything here we're just voting up or down whether or not brian was correct in his in his initial um and his initial ruling on this particular issue. All right, um, we so have, we're not. Have any other questions? We still have to do. Yep, yeah, Mr. Karen. Absolutely. Right. You're next, Mr. Bork. Uh, just one more question. Um, within the provided documentation, there was um, what appeared to be an online fax from the town website. I was just wondering how long that's been published on the town website. Um. I'm not sure of the exact date um, we started. I started editing the frequently asked questions page shortly after arriving in 2013. There was very little information on the FAQ page. So most of what you read has been placed there. And, and I can guarantee that because, because it's seven feet and not six feet, that was edited within the last two years. All right, thank you. I think Mr. Bork had a question. Yeah, uh, it's uh, actually a statement. Uh, I, I note that uh, in uh, the uh, violation notice, uh, there was a recourse that was given, which was to reduce the height of the fence to no more than seven feet. And um, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure, Brian, you weren't aware of the fact that there were deed restrictions on here at the time, et cetera. 
That's correct. I hadn't seen the deed and, and I, I should mention to the board and, and also for Mr. Nutto's benefit, the town doesn't enforce deed covenants or any deed restrictions. Right. We only enforce what we have in the ordinance or, you know, in this case, our policies that we we follow. Okay. Um, the ordinance can always address everything. I'm not saying in this case it shouldn't. I think Mr. Neto has brought up some good points and probably the ordinance should, you know, be a little clearer on, on these matters. But I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you that I've consistently enforced this rule for the seven years that I've been in, in this position. Um, and, and, and that's apparently the way it was done before me. And I don't know for how long before me, but certainly for, for a while. So, uh, so just to continue on my point then, the deed restriction is really irrelevant here. Okay, yeah, it's an issue for Mr. Nato, certainly. But as far as what we're, for what we're considering right now on this, on this uh, appeal, administrative appeal, it's irrelevant. Okay, we're, we're here just to look at whether or not the ruling you know, was correct. Um, and I think that uh, Brian, you, you know, by offering a resolution of seven feet to bring into compliance was very reasonable, especially given the fact that this contractor totally messed up on the, on the deal, didn't consult with you, uh, Brian, and, um, and, and proceeded with the project without get, you know, get, gathering enough information about whether or not it would work. And, uh, and so we can't really, I mean, that's, that's irrelevant almost. Uh, What's and, so I, I think we really have to look at it in just in just very basic terms of was the ruling correct in saying that this, this fence was more than seven feet high and therefore required a permit, okay? And, you know, the, the answer to that question is yes, it did require a permit. Um, and there was also a reasonable resolution given to reduce the, the height of the fence down to seven feet. Now, I know that's going to be expensive, but, you know, that's something that could be done. Okay. All right. I don't want, I don't want to dive into the finding of facts yet. So we're still in the questioning. Cer cer certainly not. But I'm just trying to break up yeah. some important issues and also to rule out a few things that we really shouldn't be looking at at all. We need to just narrowly focus on, you know, what, you know, the decision that was made by the code enforcement officer was it appropriate or not? So they just, what are we focusing on? Uh, and to me, you know, all the, uh, in most of the information that was presented by the appellant is quite frankly irrelevant because the key issue right here is whether or not, you know, you know was, is this a, a fence higher than seven feet, which it, it, it is, okay? And therefore did it require a permit? Okay. Uh, and that's, those are the facts. All right, let's save that for the finding of facts. Those are good. Um, does anyone have any other sort of questions for the applicant or for Mr. Longstaff before I'm going to shut this off? And so Mr. Longstaff and Mr. Nato, when we do the public hearing and then when we do a finding of facts, they are not allowed to speak anymore. So I just want to offer everyone the chance one more time for questions or comments from the applicant, Mr. Longstaff or from the board. No other questions? No. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is open this up to the public. I don't know if there's anyone attending this, the meeting this evening that would like to speak. Um, I am going to ask Mr. Longstaff to now comment on his role as the code enforcement officer because I do want to understand the level of complaints that he did receive in regards to this event. In terms of uh, public comment. I'm not seeing anyone. We have four attendees and I'm not seeing anyone as of yet raise their hands. I will keep paying attention to that as Mr. Longstaff goes along if you wish and let you know if that, oh, actually, I just saw a hand go up. Perfect. Um, so if you're ready, I yeah. will. Hi, I'm Walt Fregoni. I'm at Two Pillsbury right across the street from myself. Good evening. I talked to myself this weekend about the about the fence, um, you know, I I, meant, I I understand why he put it up because of the parking lot and the bathrooms and everything. Um, I told him I I would have appreciated if the first three you know panels may have been the lower. Um, you know, the only thing is my wife and myself was we're talking about it if 
if this fence is allowed, is the whole neighborhood going to be the same? And then that's going to take away the whole presence. Now you're saying it's supposed to be a 42 inch uh, in the deed. Um, you know, I'm thinking about putting a fence, but you know, I, I you know, I, I just, just I'm, you know, now I, I better check everything out before I do this. But like I said, the fence is a pretty fence. He didn't, he didn't cut corners. I don't think on putting up the fence, but it is a bit high, and that's how I feel. Uh, I mean, so I just wanted to bring that up. But I, I, I really hope. Uh, by letting him do it, is that going to allow the rest of the neighborhood to do the same thing? And that's what the only thing I'm really afraid of. If it's going to be right down the line, anybody in Pine Point being able to put an eight foot fence in, uh, I'd really want to scratch my head and not want that to happen. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I have, yeah, I, I appreciate you attending tonight and giving us that feedback. Thank you. Um, Mr. Longstaff, my I actually name. see another hand has gone up. Perfect. Great. I didn't do anything. Yes, Hi. Hello. Hi, Denise. Uh, yes, this is actually her daughter, Amanda. Amanda. And what's your, what, give me your full name and your address, please. Uh, Amanda Tangway. I actually live on the next street over 17 Driftwood, but I am on the deed at 2A Pillsbury with my mother, who is directly across the street from Marcel. Okay, go ahead. Um, the, this fence, I, I actually had asked Marcel months ago if he was going to be putting a fence up because I saw him clearing a lot of the trees. And uh, he didn't give us the respect at all of asking us anything about, you know, would an eight foot fence bother, bother us? Um, it literally took 80% of my mother's view away. She stares at a stark, large wall now. Um, it was done maliciously, intentionally. Um, every other neighbor I've spoke to in the area says they agree it is a spite fence. Um, I've spoken to almost everyone on our street and the next street back and they just think it is uh, obtrusive. I've submitted a couple comments from a lot of us here. It's taken away the beauty of Pine Point. It literally looks like a giant wall. Um, he knew he was putting it up. He knew how high it was going to be. He did not share that information with me months ago, even when I asked him if he was putting a fence up. He said, don't give me a hard time. And that was his reply. Um, so I do believe Marcel is lying and knew it was going to be an eight foot fence. Otherwise I think he would have had the decency to come across the street and say, hey, I'm taking away 80% of your view. Um, it was a spite fence, it is malicious. And I just can't imagine if every person on this street could put an eight foot fence up. It would, it would be ridiculous. <clears throat> Sorry, did you get that last part? I just want to thank you for attending and giving us your feedback. Yep, you're welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so it looks like we've had two neighbors attend tonight. And I mean, I guess we didn't, Mr. Longstaff, did you actually receive any letters in regards to the administrative appeal or all the complaints that you received prior to this appeal? Uh, okay, I, I, I don't understand the question. <laughs> so I understand that you issued the violation in response to complaints. Yes. Um, so I'm not sure if we can really discuss those complaints that you received prior to that. Gotcha. Um, Yes, there were there were two complaints. Um, I believe one was Miss Tangway, and then there was also uh, uh, a Mr. Goff, I believe. Um, maybe maybe Jeffrey Goff. I I'm sorry, I don't have his name right in front of me. Those were the initial complaints, uh, along with the Public Works Department noticing that the trees were being taken down. That was the first complaint. Unfortunately, we were kind of on COVID lockdown at the time. So by the time I got out there, the trees were gone and the, and the fence was up. And, um, and I hadn't received um, a call from, from the property owner or, or the fence company at that point. So, um, but I did receive letters dated or emails, I should say, not letters, emails dated um, uh, June 8, 
uh, from Amanda Tangway. Um, she in indicates in her email that she's spoken with the Fox family at 16 Pillsbury, the Proventures, the Dickey family, uh, four Pillsbury, and a few other neighbors, um, and basically echoed the comments that, that she um, mentioned tonight. And I did receive a letter from Walter Bragoni, as, again, as, I'm sorry, an email from Walter Bragoni um, on June 10th today um asking you know if he would have a chance to speak tonight so he's basically those were the those were the things that i received okay i did pull up the um the message that we received from sherry and nathan goff at 18 pillsbury we just did we address that yet um is that part of the record um it's not part of the record. That was prior to the appeal. Okay, I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Okay, so I don't. I believe we have addressed all the public concerns that have come forth in regards to this administrative appeal. So what I'm going to do now is close the public hearing and do our finding of facts and make our decision. Um, again, in regards to an administrative appeal, I think Mr. Bork did a really good job at kind of breaking this down for us. Um, it's a very straightforward, I think, kind of straightforward question for the board. We're simply asking, you know, does should the town change the way it's been operating for at least seven years? And as Brian, has test, as Mr. Longstaff has testified tonight, that this is the one they've been operating. And I mean, he referenced the code enforcement officer before him who was here forever. And so I think the question that we're, we're faced with for tonight, and while we presented with lots of evidence, um, in regards to definitions, it's really a question of, you know, should the town change their procedure and is Brian and the town been interpreting all these statutes in the wrong way for the last 7, 10, 15, 20 years? Um, I do want to share with the board that I do have an acquaintance who lives around the corner who went to sell their home about two years ago and about a week before their closing, their neighbor came to Mr. Longstaff and said, the fence is over seven feet and the acquaintance was out there with a hacksaw cutting that fence down below seven feet to close on their home when mr longstaff says he advises people and they follow his instructions i mean that is to the extent that people are following these guidelines if people didn't question him they said the fence has to be below seven and they went out there with a saw and cut it and i think that's i just want to give that example of kind of the respect people have for this this code enforcement officer in this department and things like that. Um, you know, well, none of us are attorneys. Our job is not to interpret these words and things like that. It's kind of just to see how the town is doing and have our own personal sort of interpretation. Um, so with that being said, Mr. Borg, do you want to add to that? Uh, that's, uh, that's very good. In addition to the comments that uh, I made before, uh, I think you know what we have here is a case where Mr. Longstaff clearly did his job properly according to uh, the current uh, regulations regarding height of fence, uh, responded to an after the fact situation where no permit had been requested even though the fence did require a permit. Uh, and um, you know, I think it, so in summary, I just think that um, you know, Mr. Longstaff was correct in the way he did this. Give her a moment to come back. Sorry. <laughs> I'm here. Um, thank you, Mr. Bork. Uh, Mr. Karen. All right, thank you. Uh, if we boil this down, as Mr. Bork said, to the concept of uh, the seven foot limitation regarding a permit, I'm agreement that it is clearly stated that anything above seven needs the permit. I don't have anything more to add. Mr. Hubert. Uh, I, I concur, Mr. Bork and Ms. Mr. Karen. Um, in, in the documentation that was provided as well, um, 
permits shall not be required for the following fences not over seven feet that's that is um clearly printed here in the document without looking at any of the minutia of any of the other statutes here the fence is over seven feet you will need a bird you need a building permit for this go into the town to obtain a building permit the information transfer would have occurred that um, you can't have it over seven feet in this location. It's, it's pretty black and white to me. Additionally, as well, I'll throw in that, uh, I mean, there's also the DEP side of this because they're in the back dune, and there's also, there's additional uh, corrective action that'll have to be taken, but that is outside of our purview. Okay. Mr. Howe? Uh, well, I have to say that I was down at the beach just uh, a few days ago and was really shocked at the clearing that had taken place and the fence that had been put up um, without us having been approached about it. Um, it, it, it seemed, it seemed, uh, seemed excessive. Um, and there was a lot of vegetation that was it almost appeared to me that the parking lot was was going to be expanded over all the way to the fence because there was there was so much clearing that had taken place. And as Mr. Hebert said, that's another issue. Um, I think Brian Longstaff was about the fairest person I've I've met in a long time. And uh, I think a simple phone call and a brief discussion would have brought all this to light. And it sounds like his neighbors had voiced their opinions and, 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 you know, maybe just being a good neighbor would have been a quick phone call as opposed to getting to all of this to this level. Uh, I, I mean, we're, we're talking about putting up uh, people dropping off sheds and, and, and that being a big, a big issue. Um, this is a, this is a big fence. If you haven't been there, I mean, the, the pictures don't do it justice. Beautiful fence, don't get me wrong. Gorgeous fence, but big fence. And we weren't and, and we weren't consulted. Yep. Yeah, I, I think it is a drastic change, and I think we've heard that from the neighbors and um, and so we've seen the feedback and we've heard all the information. And I think the board has done a good job at sort of coming together here on their decision. Um, does anyone have any other comments before we have a motion? No? Madam Chair, sure. yeah. uh, motion to approve appeal number 2689. Motion to second. Uh, excuse me, that's 2688. I misspoke. Motion to second. And how do you vote, Mr. Bork? No. Mr. Karen? No. Mr. Hebert? No. Mr. Howe? Absolutely not. And I vote no as well. All right, we've been denied. Good catch, Mr. Karen. I'm sure the neighbors loved that. All right. We have one more appeal. Oh, there we go. I see some new people. All right. Can you, can you hear us now? Yes, we can. Yep. All right. Good. Thank you. So our next appeal is appeal number 2689, which is a limited reduction of yard size by Kevin and Molly Christensen for 82 Sawyer Road. And so I see Kevin Christensen, it looks like, and Molly. So first, what I'm going to do is ask Mr. Longstaff from the town to just give us a little background, and then you guys can um, give us some more information.
Uh, <clears throat> yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, as stated, this is a limited reduction of yard size variance. Um, it's a single family dwelling built in 1984, again, meeting the, the time limitation um, on the home. Uh, it's on a 1.94 acre lot in the VR4 district. Um, the parcel is conforming with regard to lot area, but probably not conforming with re regard to street frontage as it appears to only have 97.22 feet. And as I think you can tell by the applicant's uh, submittal, um, it's a wedge shaped lot that fans out as it goes back. So of course, the structures are all located towards the narrowest part of the lot. And that's one of the reasons why this, this difficulty has occurred in, in trying to expand a structure uh, you know, where, where everything is located uh, in the narrowest portion of the lot. Um, and uh, what the uh, applicant will, I think, describe for you is uh, he um, proposes to build a 36 by 30 foot three bay uh, garage addition attached to the existing uh, dwelling. And this garage will have second story living space. Um, and this will go on the south end of the existing dwelling. Um, and unfortunately, in order to build a garage of that size, and I'm, I, I think the applicant will explain to you why he needs a garage of that size, or at least he'll, he'll give you his, his take on it. Uh, it will require a three foot variance from the required 15 foot side yard setback down to 12 feet. Um, and that basically in a nutshell is what's gonna happen. And I think the applicant will certainly give you more information and um, we'll go from there. Great, thank you. Okay, Kevin and Molly, thank you for joining us this evening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good. Um, do you wanna elaborate any more on Mr. what Mr. Longstaff said? Um, I think you did a good job. I, just, I don't know, um, not sure. <laughs> Do you want to? Um, Do you guys have a garage right now or no? No, no. we just have um, we have raised uh, four by thirty foot, and uh, three girls. Um, okay, I can barely hear you. Can anyone okay. else hear them? Can you hear no, me? no. Okay, can you hear me now? A little bit better. Better, yeah. Okay. Nope. That's no, not working. It's not working. No, no. Right there. Yeah. Right there. Good. Okay. All right. Um, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that last part, though? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. The audio is not working. I don't know. Is that better? A little bit. Huh. There we go. Okay. Let's try to add. Yeah. Okay. Good. So yeah, we're looking to uh, do um, a high school. We can't hear you. Is there? How about now? Is this better or? Yeah, much better. Okay. Wow. It wasn't working before. Hopefully, this is good. That's so much better. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Yeah. So we yeah we're looking to do um, a garage at, uh, with a living space above, like an in-law apartment. Um, okay. Both my my wife's and my parents are getting older, and we have kids coming up too. We have three girls uh, growing up too, um, and uh, so we uh, that was one reason why we looked at a three-car garage. Um, originally, we were looking at maybe a 32 foot wide but our contractor said uh, uh, a 36 would be best just for structural integrity um, so so that, there was so that there was enough space between each of the bays to be able to give some rigidity to to that um, so when doing that we saw that that would push it even further uh, towards the towards the um, property line so the little breezeway that we had in there for the house expansion, um, we we actually shrunk that down to eight feet entrance um, instead of I think we had like eleven or twelve before. So we tried to squeeze that in in order so that we can get the thirty six feet for the rigidity, and um, and so we're still uh, encroaching uh, to about twelve feet from the property line. 
12 and a half. It's 12 and a half, but we, we put in for 12 for the variance just in case in the field if um, there's some variance, but we did lay it out. Um, Try to put a bunch of two by fours um, to lay it out to see how it looked um, from the from the property line. Okay. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do now is we'll go through the criteria, and you guys can you know read your answers in and elaborate as you please. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So number one, the existing buildings or structures on the lot from which the limited reduction of yard size is requested was erected prior to July third, nineteen ninety one. Okay, is this uh, number one? I'm sorry. Yep, no, no problem. Sorry about that. No All right, here we are. I'm not nervous. Yep, 1984 um, is when we had our home, our home built. So you're the original owners? No, no, we uh, moved here in 2013. Okay. Uh, we, we got the house in 2014, I'm sorry. We moved to Maine in 2013. Okay, number two, the requested reduction is reasonably necessary to permit the owners or occupant of the property to use and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties are utilized in the zoning district. Uh, yeah, we, we believe so. Um, three of our neighbors across the, the street in Kitty Corner have, have a home or, and or garage uh, within five to 10 feet of their property line. Uh, the property in LC Way, um, just, just under 200 feet away, um, all in the same, same zone. Um, uh has a garage that's um as near as five feet from the property line both 89 and, and 90 sawyer road are are 10 feet or less less from their property line so it's not not uh, hugely different from in, in that in that aspect okay i'm sorry my internet did clip out a little bit there but one of the questions i did have in regards to this one was yeah. do other properties around you have three bay garages what size are the garages that they do have most of them are Most two. Are probably two. I think Bobby might have um, three. Yeah, just on this, just and around the corner, there's a, a three car. Down. There's another uh, one that has like a two and then a one. Okay, did you hear that? Yep, no, I did. Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, that's perfect. <clears throat> so there's certainly not a lot, but there are a couple. Right. And are there other properties in the area? And I don't want to get too confused here that have, because it's a, you're looking for a garage or is it an in-law um are there other properties that have similar things like that yeah there's yes. there's one down the um, road with a garage right oh yeah i mean and and the other one we we're talking about with the three car there's also an in-law above that okay. um that's an attached that's, that's a attached as well. property yeah that's the, one of our butters and um just down the road there's another one with a with a garage with apartment above um like a i think a, like an in-law or apartment i don't know <laughs> there's a living space above right Okay, perfect. Okay, number three. Due to the physical features of the lot and the location of the existing structures on the lot, it would not be practical to construct the proposed expansion, enlargement, or new structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard size requirements. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, the shape of the property is a long, narrow wedge uh, that gets narrow towards the front, only the front portion of the lot about 0.45 acres um, is buildable since the back portion of the lot is mostly like an organic, like a, like a peat type base. Um, so it doesn't really have a, a, a big bearing capacity for any kind of structure. <clears throat> We've tried uh, different uh, orientations of the garage, but with the narrowing shape of the property and the, the most efficient and aesthetically pleasing orientation is as designed. Sorry, I'm reading this exactly. Um, you guys, might, I don't know if that's okay. Um, uh, and and uh, just because we're on a, a corner, so we have the the we're garage on the inside corner. We're on the outside corner. Outside corner. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, we're on the outside corner. Outside corner. And Never um mind. and so we have the the garage kind of oriented to go along with that corner as well. Um, additionally, the proposed orientation the garage will allow for a closer proximity and better drainage uh, to the sanitary drain line. Um, oh, that's right. And uh, for the septic, um, and if we if we if we had pushed it back further, like the the the, the slope of the uh, property goes down some too. So now uh, this would be the best uh, that made most sense um, here. Right, and it sounds like you're if you were going to try to put it somewhere else, it would maybe be kind of expensive to try to get the, the land usable. Yeah. Yeah. 
And our, our septic is actually in the front of our house. Yeah. So we have to be as close to that as possible in, in order to tie in. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, number four. The impacts and effects of the enlargement, expansion, or new building or structure on the existing uses in the neighborhood will not be substantially different from or greater than the impacts and effects of a building or structure which conforms to the yard size requirement. Um, so we, we answered uh, since four, four of the neighbors are situated uh, nearer um, to their property line than our uh, variance, there should be no greater impact than what already exists. Um, additionally, the neighbors nearest structure on the side of our proposed addition that's Alvina, that's who we got the letter from, but we've talked to some of the other people as well. Um, <clears throat> it, her, her nearest structure will be about 50 feet away from um, our, our structure, whereas um, it will not be substantially different from properties that conform to the yard size requirement because the structures on the abutting properties conforming to yard size requirements can be as near as 30 feet from each other. Does that make sense? I don't know if I said that, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and then, so, and I just wrote um, in the bottom, we have a signed letter from um, Alvina, um, our, our abutting neighbor and her son, uh, Brian Williams too. I, his name wasn't on it, but he was there and he wanted to sign it too, so. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, number five, the applicant has not commenced construction or enlargement expansion building or structure to which the limited direction and yard size is requested. Yeah, that's correct. No, no construction has started. Okay. okay. Does the board have any questions for the applicant at this time? No. Nope. Mr. Karen. Well, thank you. As part of your testimony this evening, you've mentioned that uh, previous designs of the proposed garage were considered. However, yeah. it was advised against um, for structural stability. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Dave Johnson, my, my um, the person that I was kind of working with to um, asking about the garage um, and he, he suggested uh, for structural stability uh, that size. All right, thank you. Yep. I don't have any uh, questions for the uh, applicant, Madam Chair, and we'll wait for her to come back. Hi, sorry. <laughs> Welcome. I don't think there are any other questions, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, so if there are no other questions, what we'll do now is we'll, we'll open it up to the public. We'll see if there's anyone this evening that's attending that wants to speak. I do, you, you had said though that your neighbor. Yep, Alvina Williams. Submitted a letter. Yeah. Was that part of my packet? Because honestly, my paperwork just fell down and I don't know. <clears throat> Oh, I actually submitted it late accidentally because I because um, I I forgot to copy it and put it in there. Um, but I, I do have it here. Yeah, so uh, you know what you can do is if you just get that to Brian at some point, we can just make sure it's part of the public record. Um, sure. It's a little yep. off, but I'm going to ask you to read the letter to me. Yep. Um, and I wasn't sure if you had received that too, Brian, because um, I, um, I hopefully got it to you. Um, it's a uh, attention, Brian Longstaff. I have Alvina Williams owned the property at 82 years, 80 Sawyer Road that abuts 82 Sawyer Road, belonging to Kevin and Molly Christensen on the side of the property or proposed addition. I am in favor of the variance request in regards to the proximity of the property line being presented to the board by the Christensen's for their construction, respectfully. And then Alvina Williams signs. And then um, Brian, her son, was there and he, and he signed it as well. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, that'll, that'll be important to make sure that goes on the record with your appeal. So it's always helpful to have something in support. Sure. And should I you just email that or just bring the copies in or? Um, well, I'm sure you'll be seeing Brian. Okay. <laughs> okay. Cool. One way or another, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. uh, Madam Chair? Yes. Yeah. I apologize. Uh, yes, Kevin did did email that to me, but in the midst of all of this craziness that we're all dealing with, I think I failed to forward that to Doreen and 
we're all working on reduced work share hours and it fell through the cracks and I apologize. He did give it to me. So I do have a copy of it and Perfect. it will go into the record. Right. I'm sorry about that, Brian, sending it later too. It's not, it's not your fault. It's, oh, no problem. <laughs> I'm going to blame it on the virus. Um, <laughs> there you go, the absolutely. Yeah. That works for me. That's, yeah. that's my fallback for everything these days. <laughs> <laughs> it's safe, safe to blame that. Okay, so we got the letter uh, that he just read in and that was part of the record. And my understanding is there were no other emails or phone calls or issues in regards to this. And it doesn't look like anyone is attending the meeting that wants to speak. Otherwise, we would be told. So what I will do now is I'm going to close the public hearing and the board is going to do their findings of fact and conclusions of law. So we will now go through the criteria. Number one, the existing building or structure on which the lot for which the limited reduction of yard size residential is requested was erected prior to July 3rd, 1991. Mr. Bork. Uh, I'll defer to uh, Brian on this one. I don't see that in my handout. Yep. I mean, the applicant testified tonight that the home was built in 1984. I'm sure the town records would reflect that as well. Okay. We will accept that as fact. Okay. Very good. Thank you. M Madam Chair, the uh, assessor's records have it at 1984. There you go. All right. All in favor of one being met. We're waiting for Chip. There he is. <laughs> That's five. Uh, number two, the requested reduction is reasonably necessary to permit the owner or occupant of the property to use and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties are utilized in the zoning district. Mr. Bork. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, other uh, neighbors uh, have uh, garages that uh, various sizes, some uh, you know smaller, some large, some as large. Uh, and uh, I think it's very appropriate for any home in this kind of residential area to have a garage. And uh, in this particular case, uh, the garage proposed, you know, can be approved uh, with a, a five foot, well, it's gonna be less than a five foot variance on the side yard uh, setback. So uh, I, I think this, this one is certainly met. Okay, Mr. Cameron. I agree. The fact that they currently do not have a garage and they're requesting one. Adjacent neighbors and houses within the neighborhood have garages of varying sizes. Seems that this house would become uh, more in conformance. Mr. Hebert. Um, I may be reiterating, but I apologize, but a garage is a utility structure that is very common with residential units in this district. And this is not an un unreasonable request. Um, that they're asking for here tonight, so I agree. Okay, Mr. Howe? Uh, nothing to add. Okay, yep, I think they did a good job. I think we all sort of know our town and know everyone and everyone has a garage. All in favor of two being met. Okay, that's five. Three, due to the physical features of the lot and or look I'll say while we're she while Madam Chair is getting back, um, due to the physical features of the lot and or the location of existing structures on the lot, it would not be practical to construct the proposed expansion, enlargement, or new structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard size requirements. Okay, so I'll start with a comment on that. Uh, this is really the only logical place to put a garage on this lot for for various reasons. I think the, the location of the septic tank and uh, the system, I should say, and uh, the you know, the the backyard uh, soil's not being uh, proper. Uh, there's an existing driveway, you know, nearby where this will be going in. Uh, this is really the only practical place to put the garage. So it's due to the unique circumstances of the lot. That's the important thing here. I agree. Nothing further to add. I agree. As was demonstrated, the lot is a wedge shape where this most narrowest portion is nearest to the road where all the structures are. Obviously, you don't want to build a garage all the way in the back portion of your yard. That wouldn't really be economically feasible. 
um, or be practical or, or um, conform with other structures like that in the neighborhood. They're just not done. The garage is next to the home. Mr. Howe? Oh, nothing, Dad. Yep, I agree. I think you guys have done the best you can with the constraints that you were faced with. Um, all in favor of three being met. And that's five. Okay. Four, the impact and effects of the enlargement, expansion, or new building or structure on the existing uses in the neighborhood will not be substantially different from or greater than the impact and effects of a building or structure which conforms to the yard size requirements. Uh, yes, uh, I think this is true. Uh, they don't currently have a garage, while most of the neighbors do have garages. So this will make this property more in conformance with the uh, other properties in the neighborhood. Yes, I agree. Um, and the appellant has a letter from the adjacent neighbor um, in their support. Thank you. Mr. Hebert? I concur. Um, the structure looks odd, probably with not having a garage where everyone does have a garage. Uh, and again, for for equity and general look and conformance with the aesthetic uh, conditions of the neighborhood, having a garage is, is feasible. Mr. Howe. I think the property needs a garage. I just <laughs> and a, uh, having all this in-law space, be careful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. You, guys, you guys did a really good job here and i appreciate the information you provided in regards to the neighbors and the neighbors who have three bay garages two bay garages with you know living space above you know we don't know that area so it's important and helpful for you to tell us kind of what that area is like so that was that was helpful uh all in favor of four being that okay that's five Number five, the applicant has not commenced construction of the enlargement expansion building or structure for which a limited reduction in yard size is requested. Mr. Bork. Uh, Brian, can you confirm? Yes, I can confirm the construction hasn't started. Okay. Yep. That's pretty straightforward. All in favor of five being met. Okay. Do I have a motion? Yes, Madam Chair. Motion to approve appeal number 2689. I second. Okay, do we have any discussion? Okay, Mr. Bork, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Mr. Heber? Yes. Mr. Howe? Yes. And I vote yes as well. It is approved. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you all. I had a feeling you'd be seeing Brian. Yeah, Brian, thanks for all your Thank help. You, Brian. Too. I feel like we got the golden buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Good luck, Welcome. guys. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Bye. Appreciate it. Good night. Stay safe. Yeah, thank you. You too. Do I just hit leave? <laughs> yep, you're good. Right. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wasn't kidding about my internet connection. I apologize. I've I've had I've been having similar issues this evening as well. I'll freeze up for about seven to ten seconds or so, and then pop back into it. So it's I'm not sure. It wasn't too bad. I have no idea. No, it was fine. We all we all could yeah. see it in right. forward pretty well. So. Okay. Um, I don't have my agenda. Was there anything else on there, Brian? Um, uh, no zoning board comments. Um, if if nobody on the board has anything to say I, I would give you a brief update uh, madam chair um, the um, shoreland zoning amendments were approved last week at uh, council but they were approved to be effective october 1 i think i, I believe it was october 1 i should have copied that but i the reason that we made it effective october 1 is there were several prop uh, projects or at least a handful of projects that are being worked on under the old ordinance. And some of those folks, those constituents expressed their um, displeasure at because of the, the amended changes would impact how they designed their projects and they've been working on them for a while. Mm -hmm. So the board, uh, the council 
heard them. And also because of the fact that the way the um, Shoreland Zoning, uh, Mandatory Shoreland Zoning Act reads, anytime there's an amendment or an adoption of an ordinance, a town votes and approves it, they need to send it off to DEP for their approval. And DEP has 45 days during which time any applications that are received by the town must be reviewed under that ordinance. So even though we haven't received DEP's blessing, we still have to use it and really awkward. So we felt like, we felt like um, maybe what we could do is, is, is just put that off until October. And that way we might not have so many applications coming in during that 45 day time period and okay. I think I think it'll work so uh, it's just just a really odd situation so um, but that's that's it and um, we I think we'll have um, although it, we hesitate to put drafts out to the public I, I believe I can have a final draft um, there was just one or two quickie amendments on stormwater um, issues that were in there um, that we need to amend back in and, and then I, I'll have a clean final draft which I can I can make available to the board should they want to look it over and just get familiar with it but um, if if you've got more than enough things to do then there's more than enough time to do that after October 1. Well the appeal tonight piqued my interest because it was one of those lots that has two frontages and that was one of the ordinances that we would talk about changing what's the status of that one? That's a great question um, I'm so happy you brought that up <laughs> <laughs> you're like lost connection <laughs> um there there was you know that was right on the top of my priority list and then all of a sudden this there was this thing called marijuana that came along and and an adult use and medical marijuana and and then the shoreland zoning ordinances and that sort of dropped off the radar but <laughs> i i am I am definitely poised and ready to bring it back to the ordinance committee as soon as I get any indication from them that they're ready to look at it. <laughs> well, we'll extend your deadline, Brian. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I Perfect. I actually haven't drafted anything solid or concrete up with that, but I I I had I did after the the zoning board sort of said, "Yeah, we'd like you to look at that." I did do a little more poking around and I've got some more information and I I I need to get back to that. Maybe this summer I'll be able to do that. And I think we still have an opening in the board. Um, I'm, I'm working at recruiting, but if you guys know anyone who's smart and very thorough and detail oriented, like Mr. Karen, I'm reading every exhibit of every deed from now on. Yeah, Mr. Karen gets the trophy tonight. Oh man, I bet those neighbors are loving him. <laughs> That was a great catch, though. I mean, it wasn't totally applicable, but it brought to light. Hey, Deb, yeah, you're absolutely right. And then, you know, it just goes to show. Got to read every line. Okay. Well, I was hoping the meeting was going to be a little bit quicker. I apologize for my internet connections. Um, I don't know if we have anything else or if we can have a motion. I move to adjourn. Yeah, second. All in favor? And thank you, everybody. Good Thank you all. Have a good night. Have a good night. Have a good night. Thank you, Jay. You bet.